Hey, everybody. Welcome back. I'm so excited to have another terrific conversation in store for you today. If you're joining us from LinkedIn Live, from YouTube Live, or even checking us out later on in the replay. But um, I am Dr. Laura Sokola, and I'm super excited to introduce my friend and coworker, Teresa Hummel Kralinger. And she's the founder of High Five Performance. Now, High Five Performance is a, well, you know what, Teresa, take it away because it, beyond just leadership training and and Teresa has a particular superpower, which I brought her in to show you the Clark Kent to Superman, uh, Diana Prince to Wonder Woman transformation today. And she's going to teach you how to have that very same superpower, adding humor and wow. adding adding comedy. Even if you think you're not funny, yes, you, you know who we're talking to. If you go, oh my gosh, that's not me. Yes. It is. We'll find that superpower within you. And by the way, as we are doing our introductions today, please put in the chat, where are you joining us from? Where are you located? What kind of work are you in? And why don't you think comedy or humor or fun of any sort is something that is feasible or ultimately part of your world so that we can help you change that tide? Teresa, welcome. And thank you so much for joining me today. Laura, thank you for having me. I'm excited to be here. I don't even, where do you want me to start? You want me to start? Where with do you, I know I just threw out like 16 questions all at the same time and said, start now. So <laughs> give us a quick intro. What is High Five Performance? Okay, and so, then we'll go from there. And we'll go from there. So so High Five and, uh, and Laura, I'm proud to say we are 20 years old as of April 1st. And it, and it is not lost on me that I incorporated on April Fool's Day. Isn't that not... <laughs> April 1st, uh, 20 years ago. Yes. So, it, and I'm super proud. Love what I do. Can't Some days I can't even believe I get paid to do what I do because it's it's that enjoyable. But I work with leaders and organizations to create places where people want to work. And it's a broad spectrum of offerings that includes leadership and management, uh, training and coaching, interpersonal skills, coaching and training, um, and a number of good things that help create a wonderful culture. That's and really one of the hard. things that I think is lost, in particular in the uh, the virtual world in which we now tend to find ourselves, the work from home, remote and distributed teams and all that kind of fun stuff, is the fun part, is the humanizing part of the meetings when you got to get together and just banter with each other. You had your inside jokes, you had your the friends that you could be friendly with. Now you just sort of hit click, you click the button for join meeting and poof, there you are. And everybody goes, okay, it's officially 101. We should have started by now. Let's get, and of course at 1259, you're going, shoot, I got to get off this meeting because at one o'clock this has to end. And I have to mentally and digitally teleport into my next meeting and be ready to go right away. And we have to keep things moving. There's no buffer. There's no connection time. There's no joy. In it. Yeah. And I think that's really the idea. It's not about being funny for funny sake, humor or whatever words we've been using, but it's about just remembering that we like each other. We should enjoy where we work, who we work with, and the experience of being together, even when we're meeting to talk business. And thank you, by the way, everybody who's popping into the chat with where you're from. I see people joining us from YouTube and from LinkedIn, New Jersey, Oklahoma, Virginia, New York City, Pottstown, all sorts of great uh, places. So thank you all for joining. Um, any initial thoughts you wanted to add? I just... Well, well Laura, I, I think it's a, it's a mindfulness thing. Um, it doesn't just happen usually like we have to plan for it so with zoom meetings a lot of us are doing things virtually now yes um i tend to log on early if i can and people know that i tend to log on early so if they want banter they too log in early or Schedule permitting you know, and, and I can tell you, I do this thing um, with a wonderful organization in Center City. We do this thing called TED Talk Tuesday and we get together. People have watched a TED Talk and then we get together for an hour to talk about it. It is rich and wonderful. Well, it's supposed to go from like noon to one. I'm logging on at about 1145. Mm. And I'll tell you, Laura, there are people who know this is going to open up at 1145. Let me hop in because they want the banter. They want to hear the non-TED Talk conversation. I would also suggest when you open a meeting, if particularly if you're fully virtual, 
take the first couple minutes and say, before we dive into the content, who has something cool to share? Is there anything mm. good going on in your life? You know, we, we don't get the chance to talk in the hall like we used to. Yeah. Who has something cool to share? Cool vacation, bought a new house, kid got into college, whatever it is. Right. Open right. on a warm, fun note. But you, it's a mindfulness thing. You have to plan for that. And speaking of mindfulness, let's put on everybody's mind out there some of the stuff that we're going to be diving into today. So uh, everybody knows exactly why they need to go grab their sandwich if you're logging in during your lunch hour, whatever it happens to be, and why you're going to want to stick around from start to finish. Because um, we're going to talk about everything from how to humanize the meetings and how to bring the the fun connectivity back. And, and Teresa just mentioned one way about how to opening up, uh, open it up a little bit on the early side and make space for that. The but even more so, we're going to talk about things like. Uh, <laughs> here's a thought: even if you're an introvert or shy or fill in the blank with whatever self. Uh, descriptor you like to use, you too can be funny. You too can add humor. You too can make, and I don't mean slapstick, knock, knock jokes. I mean, if that's your thing, you know, who's to judge, but it's not a one size fits all, right? And Teresa, I'm going to have her give her, give her background in a little bit, because I think everybody out there who's got already some head trash excuses, the reasons why I can't do this. I'm not sure why I'm logged in because I'm pretty sure I can't, but I'm curious, just like there's this little window of hope in the back of your mind that says, maybe I'll learn some things that might not terrify me at the note. Yeah, you will. So we'll talk about, uh, she'll share some resources, uh, things that are online, different classes, different books, different websites, et cetera, where you can go to learn more and to build up your skill set. Um, she'll give everybody out there some strategies that you can use right away to humanize and and add energy and positive connection and fun back to a meeting. Uh, and just, you know, when I use words like fun and humor and if anything along those lines, remember that it's always about contextually appropriate. Right. We're not trying to turn you all into jokesters. We're not turning this into a stand-up comedy act. We're not, we understand you guys work in the compliance department of a company like Comcast or Independence or you know Intel or Dropbox or wherever it is where maybe you have great rapport with your people, you know, whoever mm -hmm. is your coworker, your friends, et cetera, but be your department, or, and I don't mean to stereotype or generalize or whatever, but if your particular organization isn't known for a stand-up comedy routine, fine. We're not trying to make you be anybody other than who you are, but we want to bring the energy and the joy back into those connections with each other. So, um, and we do also not just want to know where you're from. And I see more and more people, Sonoma County, which is awesome, more people from New York and Philadelphia. Um, but what questions do you have? What fears do you have? What um, what would you like to know? What resources would be helpful to help you amp up the fun and the energy and the connection with your people? Throw those in and we'll address them as they pop in or as, as we have the opportunity to do so. But um, in launching from here, Teresa, can you give people a little bit of a background? Because in, aside from being a trainer, you are actually a trained stand-up comedian. Yes. Yes. Were and you always the funny kid? Well, you know what? I think I always had an amazing sense of humor. Mm -hmm. I bet everybody but, out there can identify with that. You know, in their right? mind, they know they're funny. Love to laugh, um, kind of see the world in a funny way. And I think some of it is just a survival technique because the world can be kind of a crazy, daunting place. And, and if we don't have a sense of humor, um, it's going to be tough. But I, I'll tell you, growing up, um, I was very shy. Um, I would rather be behind the scenes than on the stage. Uh, this went on through high school. Um, I actually picked an all-girl college because I felt safer there and did not want to be on. It's amazing. I didn't want to be on stage, didn't want to be in front of people. So I get into the corporate world and, and I fall into the training department, literally fall into it. Um, what a blessing because it built an entire career for me. But in the training department, interestingly enough, I was not a stand-up trainer. In the beginning, I was an instructional designer and uh, God love Prudential, my 
previous employer who paid for my education uh, by one of the best instructional designers in the world at that time. And I designed training and gave it to other people to deliver because, interesting. oh, I don't get up in front of people and do that. That's what other people do. Right. And I remember the manager of our department saying, Teresa, you're going to go to a conference and you're going to speak on uh, how to do computer-based training because you've won an award for, believe it or not, mainframe computer-based training. So I'm Doesn't dating that myself sound like fun. Yeah. Oh my gosh. What a delight. I, I loved it. Mainframe. Said, you're going to speak for us. You're going to represent us. And I said, oh no, no, I will not because that's not who I am. That's not who I look at. The late, we talk about head trash. The label I had given myself is you are someone who, who works diligently in a cube. You don't get up on a stage and speak to people. Craziness. Well, as it all turns out, I did get up on a stage and I've gotten up on a stage many, many times. And I learned how to speak publicly, which was a huge deal. Then craziness of craziness, 2002. I leave my corporate job and I have some time for the first time in my life. There is a stand-up comedy course at Montgomery County Community College. It's eight weeks. It's $89 for this eight-week course. It is five minutes from my house. And I thought, there's no way I could be a stand-up comedian because that's not who I am, right? That's not who I am. But wouldn't it be great to take this course and learn some techniques to weave humor into my speaking and training. I take the eight week course. There's 20 of us at the start. Nine of us graduate. Wow. I know because Laura, writing and performing stand up comedy isn't easy. It's just, it's not easy. But if you work on it, and I did, I had about five minutes of solid content. And I got on stage with those nine other people and did my five minutes and people laughed. People Isn't laughed. that the most empowering feeling when it you was, share something and you actually get the laugh on cue? It was crazy. Now, the, it, here's the difference. When you're speaking, Laura, if you get a good solid belly laugh every five minutes, you're a rock star. In comedy, you need to get at least six laughs a minute. Wow. Think about that. One every 10 seconds. Most people it's, can't it's even get finish a sentence in that amount of time. Yeah. Now, some of it is you have a setup that takes the time. That's not funny. But then you have your punchline that gets a laugh. And then you have taglines after that that keep the laugh going. Yes. So, but I share all this to say in my head, I had told myself, I'm not a speaker, I'm not a stand-up comedian. But in reality, I am now paid to do both those things. Isn't that amazing? And can, can we just take a moment and sit with that? Because I'd be curious in the chat, if you feel so bold, can you put, uh, you know, on a, let's keep it really simple, like yes or no, would you consider yourself funny in, in the sense of the kind of person who can tell a joke in the middle of a presentation or just, you know, make a funny comment, make a, you know, make a tongue in cheek comment and appreciate that somebody's probably going to, to laugh at that point. Would you be comfortable using, are you funny enough that you'd be comfortable using, you know, throwing out a joke here and there in the course of a meeting? We're not even talking about a major conference presentation, a, a regular meeting. Is that you? Yes or no? see if what kind of uh, breakdown we get from the people uh, who, who are joining us here today. But I, I want to just back up a second because it, what is the one of the hardest uh, mental blocks to break through, and, and, and I think we all do ourselves a disservice in so many ways, is the notion of, you know, we put ourselves, we don't want to be stereotyped, but Boy, do we put ourselves into a very yeah. small box when we say, that's not me. Yep. This is me. And then we throw down the trump card of the vocabulary word of the decade, which is, it's authentic. I'm being authentic. I'm oh, going to be myself. Please. And so that's oh. my authentic self. That's not authentically me. Don't make, oh, look, 
by definition, any learning curve whatsoever, it can be a learning curve that's this steep or that's this steep, but any learning curve requires stepping out of the comfort zone. And doing so can feel inauthentic when it's awkward and not smooth and not second or third or fourth nature at that point. That's called learning. You'll get there. It will become second nature to some point or other. But what is authentic is whether or not you are making that leap, whether or not you're on that journey willingly. If you choose to take that step and say, I'm going to learn how to do this. Yeah. And I know it's going to be a little painful in some ways, but I really, really want the result. And I'm willing to stumble, bumble, fumble. And look, having done a little bit of not formal comedy, but what you know, you got to test your material. You do. And that means some of it's going to work and some of it's not. And that's okay. And some of it will work with certain audiences or not with other audiences. So it can't always be a hundred percent hit. So, it, but if you look at it, you say every time it doesn't work to say, well, I failed. I'm, it wasn't authentic. I shouldn't do. No, you, you have to accept just like in, in any sort of business iteration, software iteration, whatnot, you have to keep iterating and keep growing and trying stuff out to figure out what does work for you and for that particular audience. So please, everybody out there, especially if you're someone who is, who's, is really rooted to claiming the introvert identity as a, as a mask in some ways, if you're using it as an excuse to not put yourself out there, to not try things, please, and I'm not disparaging introverts by any way, shape, or form, but don't let that be the, the justification to not try this. Because there are, and somebody made a, a comment earlier about, you know, how do you, um, make sure that you're bringing the funny, but not making it appropriate and not bring, making it turn into an HR issue later on or, you know, right. all that kind of stuff. But just be willing to step out of that comfort zone, baby steps, but take the steps, start the journey someplace and know that that choice, if it's authentic, that's what matters most. Yeah, I, I, I want to suggest people use saver lines. So you talk about not every joke is going to get a laugh. I, I mean, there are times where I have a joke that I've done a number of times that always work, but for whatever reason, it falls flat. You still have to approach that with confidence. And what you do is you have a saver line planned and a saver line. In fact, if you Google saver lines, you will probably get some good canned saver lines. So if I do a joke and it doesn't work, I'll pause and I'll think of somebody who's in the room and I say, that's the last time I want to use one of Laura's jokes. Right. Or you'll get that on the way home. Right. Or, hey, sometimes I do these just for myself. There's there's one joke that I do just for myself. It's a, it's a, it's a silly joke where I, I talk about the nuns in school. We had Sister Jackie Chan. She had two uh, uh, rulers hooked together with rosary beads. They were nunchucks. They were nunchucks. Uh, but okay, it's a I'm never going to end broadcast. Thank you. you. Know, <laughs> it's it's a groaner, right? And and I pause now. Some people laugh. Some people go, oh. But I always say, sometimes I do these just for me, and that's my saver line. But when you you approach it with confidence, you don't say like, holy cow, was that not funny to you? You you say, you know what? I think that's funny. I'm still doing it. And but saver lines, there's hundreds of them, hundreds of them. I, I once taught, taught a group of eight to 12 year olds stand up comedy. This was a Temple University Ambler campus. And they really I that was fun. Oh, my gosh. Laura, insane, insane. So they can't write their own material. I, I gave them jokes in an envelope, whatever. But I taught them saver lines. I said, listen, when they don't laugh, have a few of these memorized. The beauty of eight to 12 year olds is they did. They did memorize a few and they would do their joke. And if they didn't get laughter, they would say, that's the last time I use one of Teresa's jokes. Nice. And I thought, oh my goodness, <laughs> who actually did it? But anyhow, save your life. Even if you're just, a, if you're a speaker, you don't have to be a stand up comic. If you're a speaker and something's a clunker, have a saver line. Right. 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 And maybe you're just, you're giving your, you know, Monday morning team update, you know, you're looking through the balance sheet, you're the accounting person and you're going through whatever else and you decide to throw in a little comment there and okay, it doesn't, you don't get the giggle or the smirk or whatever that you sort of hope for. Then throw in the saver line and see if that one works. It, it yes. doesn't have to be. And what will probably be even funnier is the fact that no one expected you to do it. 
Right. If it's not something that's part of your normal routine yes. and what they've come to expect from you, it's the kind of surprise, like, did, did he actually say that? And, um, it, you know, they, they laugh at themselves later on for being surprised at, for the fact that you were actually funny, but you were funny enough that they didn't actually laugh. They were just amazed that like, that was actually funny. That, that yes. was impressive. Yeah. And that's okay. And, and sometimes the savor line is what gets the laugh. Yes. Yeah. You know, that's that. And I, and I love uh, Kim's comment here, being vulnerable shows strength. Yes. Absolutely. When people can see you're comfortable with yourself on stage and you're able to laugh at yourself or a mistake that you've made. Oh yeah. You're in. I had a, I was doing a training at a conference. There were a couple hundred women in the room and um, I, I was going through my spiel. And those of you who've, who've heard either my Ted talk or some of my um, other basic trends, one of the things I talk about in voice is, is up speak. And that's one of the things that drives me bonkers when people talk as if there's lots of questions because their voice keeps rising at the ends of all their phrases and sentences. And it's just very repetitive over and over again, kind of drives you nuts. And I, I said, I, I heard the line come out of my mouth and I was talking about using, not inflecting questions, but using vocal periods. And so, I, it, you know, I'm talking, I'm like, ladies, please stop using up speak. You have to learn to love your periods. And I heard myself say it. <laughs> and I, I paused and there was dead silence. And I said, at the ends of your sentences, Beautiful. And the whole place burst out laughing. And then I stopped Beautiful. again and I went, that sounded better in my head. And then Beautiful. the place lost it completely and totally. And I mean, like guffawing, belly laughs, people falling out of their chairs, whatnot. But your point a moment ago is why that worked, because I didn't shrivel. I didn't, nope. you know, there was a part of me that went, but, wow. but you know, you save it at that. And yes. it, it was totally unplanned. I had no intention of, of going in that it was a complete ad lib, just got to, okay, figure out what to do with this at the moment. But to, when you catch yourself doing it, even if you just make a joke at yourself, like, wow, well, that was a rather fem female empowerment moment that I hadn't expected to throw in here, you know, whatever it is that you don't act sheepish right. or apologize for. I mean, unless you say something egregious and that's a whole different ball game. This was right. not, if anything, this was the perfect audience to make that kind of a blunder in front of had it been mixed gender audience, it would have been a little bit more awkward, but nevertheless, you know, if you can land you know, own the, the wah, wah, wah at or wherever it is, but without seeming, or at least without projecting embarrassment. Yes. About don't telegraph that embarrassment, just kind of own it and go, yep. okay, note to self, don't quit day job and back to accounting. Thank you very much. You know, it's, but people will appreciate that. You know, I'll say every now and then something like, but I'm ching. Thank you very much. I'll be here all week. And then that gets the laugh because yes. they're like, okay, yeah, you're a dork, Laura, but okay, whatever worked. So Saver lines, and to your point, just roll with it. Almost well, like who was right. it? Pee Wee Herman who used to say, "I meant to do that." Like <laughs> <laughs> there you go. It, it, confidence is half the battle. Um, I honestly think that th there are some comics whose material is not particularly clever, but they deliver it with such gusto and such confidence that you love them. Yes, you love them. It, yes, it, it is more than half the battle. I, I honestly think that's how I get away with comedy. <laughs> well, I, and I Jeff, uh, Jeff Dunn put in the chats. So he said, yes, dad jokes. Oh, and love dad jokes. There's, love there's no, it's, I did a training a couple of weeks ago for, actually it was another women's group, but the, um, I, I asked the question, you know, does anybody know out there know someone who just thinks they're an awful lot funnier than they actually are? And one of the women in the back is like, isn't that a prerequisite for being a dad? And of course the place cracked up and there you go. And we got a guy who's going right. to get right there. That is the definition of the, the dad joke is, nope, you know, it's terrible and you do it wanting to everybody else to groan. And then you get to laugh at having made them groan. It's, it's all about, st about style. We've got, we've got some interesting questions here. I just see Holly's question. Yep. Um, I can force myself to do this, but how do I stop my face from flushing bright red? It's a problem. You know what? My face gets bright red too. I, I don't know if it's my Irish heritage or what it is, but I tend to get a, a red face. But you have to love the humor that you're sharing. It has to be coming from, from a part of you. 
Um, and then I saw another question about what about HR? It's so funny because this Thursday, I'm doing a keynote for uh, a big HR conference in New Jersey. And I'm going to ask them, hey, who wants me to open with comedy? To which you know, at four o'clock in the afternoon, they're going to say, yes. And I'll say, well, wait, don't tell HR. Meanwhile, the whole room is filled with HR people. But let me tell you something you want to think about, and you know this, you guys are smart. What are the topics you don't play with? Yes. What are the topics you don't, like, don't get into politics. I'll tell you what, there, over the last decade, let's just say it, a long time, there's a lot to poke fun at. But you don't want to divide the office, mm -hmm. the audience. You don't want to hit a hot button. So nothing about uh, politics, race, religion, anything like that, that would set off um, an alarm button for HR and would potentially offend somebody. Having said that, you're always going to have people in your group, not always, but you sometimes have people who are looking to be offended. Mm, yes. Be smart. Because Laura, you know, I see you nodding your head. Just be smart. You have to know your audience and be like, you know what? Damn, this is so funny. I just want to do it. But she is not going to like this. Is it worth it? Judgment call. Judgment call. Yeah. Yeah. And when in doubt, if you're not sure, <laughs> yeah. err on the side of being concerned of caution at that point, you know, you really yeah. don't want it to go down the other direction. So now you can never be a hundred percent sure. And, you know, I, you, you just never know who is going to find something, you know, yeah. I mean, I've done trainings where at the end, one person will write in the comments in the feedback forms, like you had some very sexist stereotypes that you're purporting in, in promoting what does she call it? Uh, misogynistic by it. And I'm going, wow. Were we in this same? And like, I went up and I spoke to the, the four women who were running the, the training and two were African-American, two were white, two were, and I'm thinking, did, out of curiosity, any idea what this is referring to? And and they all looked at me, maybe it's a generational thing. I don't know. Cause I don't know who wrote it. And, you know, Everybody was over the age of 40. So maybe it was, a, and I missed something from, but you just know. So there's always the chance that someone is, and I don't even know that it was necessarily a joke that I made. It was, but right. somebody didn't like whatever I shared. Someone's always not, there's always a chance somebody's not going to like you. Right. And, you know, I'm not a Seinfeld fan. I, sorry, I know, crazy. And most people just are like, Laura, I can't be friends with you anymore. I don't understand. I don't get it. I want to get it. I've watched shows, you know, episodes funny. of people in rooms full of people screaming with laughter. I don't get it. So it, you, no. you can't please everyone all the time. That being said, you know, try. Right. There's some things that are just safe. And I'll give you, I'll give you an example. So first of all, I want to share with you guys a technique. And I, and I told Laura I would share yes. this technique. Yep, so yep. there's this thing called rule of three. And rule of three is so, so useful. It is where you state two things that are serious and expected and one thing that is funny and unexpected. There's a million of them. And I think and unexpected is the key word. So just before you go into that example, let's let's let people process that for a second. It's not that you're going for massive punchline. It's the notion of irony. If your yeah. people are expecting something and then you just say something that makes them go, oh, what? That they'll find humor in the surprise. That's it. The unexpected. So go ahead, give us an example. So any of you can do this. And I have a whole bunch of these written down, but I thought about this while we were, while we were chatting. Big uh, conference, DIA, Drug Information Association, big pharmaceutical- Any free conference. samples? Um, anyway. I know, we, we could do it, we could do, okay. won't get into drugs. Anyway, <laughs> here we go, bad choice. But anyway, big pharmaceutical conference. And I had about- Oh man, I don't even know, four or 500 people in the eyes. It was a big crowd. And I, and the whole course was about presentation skills, particularly mm. for dry topics, which my pharmaceutical friends certainly could relate to. So I said, how many of you show of hands have sat through a really boring presentation? Every hand goes up. Mm. How many of you have sat through a really boring presentation delivered by a really smart person? Every hand goes up. Pause. How many of you are the really smart person delivering the really boring presentation? That's the unexpected. How many of you are the really boring person 
or the really smart person delivering the boring presentation. They laugh, they get it, and they're like, and I say, that's why we're all here. No one is going to be offended by that. No right. one. So that's a good rule of three. I have a couple rules of three in my act. Um, I typically perform around the Philadelphia, New Jersey, Delaware suburbs, for lack of a better word. So I'll, I have a show coming up in Norristown this weekend. I will say, I've always wanted to be a comedian my whole life and perform in exciting cities like New York, Los Angeles, and Norristown. Norristown is, so do you see how a three, the rule of three, a three-part setup works? Two serious, one funny. You right. can do this. You can do it. Yes. Yes. And you know, you, you're you going through agenda items in your PowerPoint deck. You're going through whatever list of bullets here and there. Prior to hitting bullet number three or number four, something you can throw in whatever your little tongue-in-cheek ad lib or pre-planned ad lib joke is, and then say, no, 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 that's not really it. It's this one. And then go to whatever's actually there, but just, you know, see who's paying attention. See who's even awake, yes. but you can play with it a little bit. Again, always know your audience. Yep. But the, the funny thing is, I think that most people <clears throat> want to be pleasantly surprised by receiving the gift of a laugh. Yes. Because to your earlier point, it, most people are are really tired of being bored. Yes. They're tired of being uninspired. And so if you're going to give them an opportunity to find, you know, when you smile or even better, when you laugh, the endorphins that you get and the change, the, the dopamine receptor and all those kinds of things that happen in the brain change everything. They change how the listener feels about you. They change how alert they are, how receptive they are to the content, no matter how dry the content is. Mm -hmm. It changes so many things in your relationship and in how people perceive the value of what you bring. Now, of course, there's always the line. That we're not trying to be slapsticky. You want to you know, stay appropriate. And uh, you know, Linda offered a very generous comment as far as in the in the chat there, but that the huge challenge to be both funny and smart or serious or taken seriously. Uh, and that you know the two of us are, are doing a pretty good job of modeling that balance. So Linda, thank you for that uh, acknowledgement. Uh, and it is something that we, I think, have both learned to hone over time. And when we've done certain trainings enough that we know what works in those shticks, right, in, in those programs, um, this is obviously a very ad-libbed conversation. You know, we had a little prep call a, a week or two ago just to sort of mm -hmm. get a, a brainstorm list of the kinds of stuff that we could talk about here, but this is otherwise completely on the fly. And it is, but you don't have to launch into a full sequence act, but it's just a matter of try throwing one comment in yes. your next time around or open the meeting or close the meeting with a little something or other and just see how it changes. You know, I um, one of the most common trainings that I'm running that I've been running for the last 18 months or so is my virtual influence training program, which, you know, there's shorter and longer versions of it, but it's all about how to be good here because most of us, I think, would like to rename ourselves on our Zoom or whatever logins and take out our name and put in a disclaimer that says, I just want you to know, if you met me in person, you'd be impressed. <laughs> you know? And two years ago, that might have been OK. But no, virtual is the new normal now. You, you yes. have to be just as charismatic and professional and confident and inspiring and able to connect in the virtual world, if not more able to do so here than you can otherwise do in person. So, you know, in doing that training, the clients that are bringing me in to do the full intensive, it's a half day, three, three and a half hour block here. Most people can't get through 45 minutes yes. with your average meetings. And, you know, the, the best comments that I get at the end of those are, oh my gosh, this time flew by. I actually had somebody um, just not long ago, a couple of weeks ago, at the end we were debriefing and she was cute. She she unmuted and she said, Laura, you know, I got to tell you, I'm a little miffed at you. I said, why is that? And she said, well, because knowing I was coming into a half day virtual training, I had a whole stack of work that I was planning on getting done while multitasking. And she's like, this was so interesting and so valuable. 
I didn't get any of it done. Now, when am I supposed to do my work? You know, and I, it was cute, but it's the idea of how do you find that energy and just being able to throw in those, those lines here and there to, to wake people up again, just one here, one there, it revitalizes, it re-energizes. And that is part of, of where I'll use it because you can't do, I mean, you can barely do a 30 minute meeting where everything is just, okay, now we're going to run through spreadsheet oh, line 147. Now let's look at line 140. No, please don't do that. And yeah. you know, you, you need to, to amp it up a little bit and people will thank you for yeah. it. Yeah. And, and people, if you're doing anything longer than 90 minutes on zoom, you better keep it moving. Yes. You better. And, and when I say keep it moving, this isn't just about a laughter. If you get a laugh once a half hour, you're a rock star in, in a webinar world. It's about asking questions, doing a breakout, showing a video, uh, pulling up a whiteboard, taking some notes. It's keeping things shifting every few minutes because our attention span is super short. And just like your attendee who's like, man, I was planning on getting some work done. It's just to keep their sanity because some of these webinars are just, and others, three hours goes in. You're like, holy cow, we were just on at eight o'clock. Here it is 11. I can't even believe it. Yep. The difference is that's mindful. You're, you're planning on keeping things moving every few minutes. Yes. Absolutely. And and That's- there's a great question in the chat or, or comment uh, from Jeff as far as when you prepare a presentation, he asks himself, you know, what's funny about this or what could yeah. be funny? And here's a tip. When trying to figure this out, if you were in the audience, what would you be thinking? And then vocalize that, like verbalize, tell people what's in your head, throw yourself under the bus. And, you know, most people are afraid to quote unquote, admit a weakness, but it's not really about admitting weaknesses. If you're going to, and I'm not coming up with a perfectly good example at the moment, but to, to be able to say, look, I know when I'm sitting in the, in that spot, all I can sit there and think is when's lunch, how many things can I check my phone, my, this, my, that all at the same time. I'm good. You know, when you, when you tell people what your internal or what your own head trash is, I'm, I'm asking myself, okay, is this really funny? Can I ask this question? Would that really be funny? Or would that be offensive? What if this person, what if that person? And when you let people know what's going on inside your mind, inevitably, here's the thing, we're all human. So there's a really good chance that more than half of the people in that group are also having those same thoughts and those same concerns and that same head trash and those same wonderings. So they're going, oh, you're thinking that too? Oh, that's good to know. Okay, thank you. I will. I, I feel better now. I feel like you understand me. If you can do it, maybe so can I. And then they'll appreciate that you've kind of right. outed them, so to speak, because you've just voiced the voice in their head which they didn't think they were telegraphing, but apparently you were able to read their mind. So it's share what your inner thoughts are, what your concerns would have been, you know, those, those inner pieces. And if you can make fun of yourself in the process, others will do it, you know, not in a way that tells, to tell people that you were stupid or that you, you know, ruined uh, something or other, but it, it just in a way that addresses the humanity that's in us all. It is more relatable then it then it, it's not going to undermine your authority going back to that point as long as you deliver it with confidence yeah uh, confidence is absolutely the key and a lot of this it, it's a combination of being confident and being mindful like planning to put things in to keep people's interest instead of just showing powerpoint yes there's a bunch of things you can do and I don't have access to the chat or I would cut and paste this in there. So I'm going to, I'm going to, okay. show you, I, you know why? Cause I'm, I'm in it as a presenter and not in the, in I'll the put stuff in. go ahead, put it in the chat and then I'll move it. But you know what I'll do? I'm going to put it in. So you guys, the way this works is Laura can see my chat, <clears throat> but you can't see my chat. So I'm going to give it to Laura. Well, and Teresa's going to have to be really it. nice to me so that she can make me uh there, there we, we go. go. Uh, so All she's right. just added a couple of ways to make humor. Let's see. I'm going to copy these and paste them right into the chat go. here. So break this down for us. Here so we've got, this should be rule of, three. Here we go. rule of three. We talked about um, analogies, similes, metaphors. Um, like she was a couch potato in the gravy boat of life. 
Um, her hair was a perfect oval, like a circle that had its two sides gently compressed by a third thigh master. Now that's going back to the eighties. So some of you didn't get that, but thank you for laughing anyway. Uh, double entendre. I actually have a, a cute little joke in my act where my husband and I have been married for a long time. He read an article that said, if you really want to spice up your love life, you should pamper your partner. So he made me wear disposable diapers and it really did kick it up a notch. So double entendre usually has a sauciness to it. You may not be using this in the business setting <clears throat> unless you have a really cool crowd, which sometimes you do. But double entendre callbacks is when something happened earlier. It could be funny, could be unexpected, but it's memorable. And then you have something funny to tag back to what happened. It's almost like an inside joke. I love doing this on a comedy stage because it's an inside joke for the audience. They love it. Um, I use body language, facial expressions, sometimes impressions. So I work with Joe Conklin. Joe Conklin has a good third of his act, if not half his act, on impressions because he's wonderful. Um, crowd work. This is interesting. So crowd work in the comedy sense is playing with the audience with a give and take. Um, certainly crowd work in a classroom or in a meeting room is the same kind of thing. But once you open it up, you've opened it up. I have yes. my comedy instructor said, Teresa, if you open the door, you need a window to get back in. Just remember that. Um, storytelling. Storytelling is powerful and they don't have to be funny. But boy, if they are, people are going to remember your point. Um, here's low hanging fruit. Cartoons pictures, mm. videos. Some of this stuff is free on the internet. I know uh, there's a couple cartoonists. I pay about $40, $50 per cartoon to put in my PowerPoint. Well worth the money and a nice little laugh break. Um, you can also use props. People love it when you bring some cool, fun things into the meeting room or the classroom and they're wondering, what's she going to do with that? Yeah. So all of these things are little things you can do. Pick the ones that resonate with you. Yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. And playing with the audience, you know, depending on how well you know them and yep. it, you know, you always want to uh, be mindful of what's the topic, who's the audience, you know, be careful of those kinds of things. I did a training a little, <clears throat> a little while ago for the compliance department at Comcast and, you know, compliance department, not it, it, the irony is uh, on the flip side, I do some trainings with, you know, asset management firms and whatnot, where before they do their market updates in webinar form or whatever, the compliance department has to take a pass at the script first. And then I'm supposed oh, wow. to work with it. I'm going, wow, if there's somebody who's not putting at the top of their resume, awesome at writing, engaging copy. It's the people in the compliance department, typically they're geniuses and other things. We're so glad they're there, but writing engaging copy not so much so i went to do this training with it with the compliance department and in the morning i was getting ready to go in and my husband who's a lawyer said you know so where are you going today i said i'm going to do this this program for the compliance department and he said ah got it so here's what you need to know laura lawyers do have a sense of humor they just don't like to show it <laughs> and you know, so I walk in and, and when we were, well, the person introduces me and I, you know, welcomed the group or at least thanked them for having me there. And I told them that story. And I said, you know, so here's the thing. My husband's an attorney and I told him this and blah, blah, blah. And so, um, so, and I said, so, so apparently there's hope or what is it? So <clears throat> the, uh, but they do have it. They do have a sense of humor. They just don't like to show it. And then all of a sudden, somebody in the back of the room, because apparently the, the compliance department was also some you know accountants and more financial people, not just strictly attorneys. And so somebody in the back calls out, we're not all lawyers. And somebody else calls out, so there's still hope. And this banter starts going back and forth wow. in the group. And I was like, well, this is definitely not the way I saw this going. But they're all cracking each other up going, OK, you want to play this game? Good. I like it. That helps me to see what the energy of the room is. And again, to our earlier point, they're hoping they're going to have some fun with this. They want to have some fun with this. They, they want to know that you're going to let them play. And often I will, I'll even use that word play in, in when I'm opening the, the training or the event up to uh, some sort of exercise, whether it's using video cameras or having somebody up to join me for a role play or doing whatever it happens to be, people get nervous in those yeah. kinds of moments. So, you know, and, and 
everything that I do, it's always safe space. I'm never going to put anybody on the spot. I'm never going to do whatever else. If someone volunteers for it, that's a different ballgame. But uh, when making sure that they're comfortable, if they're willing to play, if they're indicating that they're willing, and I'll, that's where the word comes in. When it's time for those exercises, I'll say to them, okay, everybody, I need you to play with me. Who's willing to play with me and to come and do, because it's going to be fun. It's going to be, it, it, but it's still going to be serious. And that's the thing. As long as what I'm about to do with you is going to deliver results, then I don't worry, back to that earlier comment, about undermining my authority. Right. If anything, using well-timed and well-framed humor elevates your Absolutely. authority and elevates the respect that they have for you because they learned what they need to learn from you. It's stuck better because when they're in that that higher level, higher emotional and cognitive state of, of um, receptiveness, because you've got more of their synapses firing, they appreciate you and you've given them a good emotional experience on top of the whole thing. You're the total package, not just a brain. Right. And that's what we really want. There's actually, um, there's a book out there. It's been out for a little while. It's called Laugh and Learn. Donnie Tamblin wrote this book. And Donnie, um, she's an actress. She's an improv person, but she also was a corporate trainer. And she did the research to put this book together that says, if you, if people are having fun, if they are relaxed, if they're laughing, and to your point, Laura, there's like all kinds of cool brain chemicals that go on when we're enjoying ourselves and, and, and having a good time. It actually improves your retention. It improves your yes. learning. And that's the whole point, right? We're coming together to do these workshops. Um, it's a great book. So it's a, it's dated. It's been out there a while. Uh, Donnie since retired, but you'll look at some of the research she did uh, for those of you that like data and want to back this up with some facts. Yes. Right. Yes. So, and I see Jermaine, you, you've asked for the comics. You know what? If write to me after this, when you get my email, just write to me. There's a few that I've used. Of course, I can't think of them off the top of my head, but I can send you some links. And I'm telling you, well worth the money to buy those comics. Yes. And I mean, really, you can go online and just go to Google Images and type cartoons on X and see what's there. And you'll see which ones are actually cart. There's one, I think it's called Cartoon Stock. Dot yeah. com or something along those lines, it's just like stock photos, I stock photo, whatever else. They have cartoons that are intended to be used in these kinds of presentations. You'll see I, other cartoons. You have to be careful of what you're going to use for what purposes, and you know where is the copyright limits on things. But otherwise, if you can, if you have the option to purchase it, just buy it, and you'll see which ones are there and, and for sale. Here's one, Ted Goff. So his is newslettercartoons.com. I've purchased a couple of his, Ted Goff. He's got some good stuff out there. So there's a little plug for Ted Goff, who I've never met, but he's always very appreciative when I buy a cartoon. Yes. Yep. Um, and let's see, there was a question. And for some reason, when I post um, on the chat, it only goes to the YouTube. So um, if it's, Holly, if you're there and you can put it through LinkedIn for me, the uh, the book is Donnie Tamblin, D-O-N-I-T-A-M-B-L-Y-N. That's the, the laugh and learn book. Yeah. Um, and let's see, it looks like Karen shared Sam Matthews at Art Across Borders, artacrossborders.com. Nice. So nice. great stuff. Hey, Karen, giving you a shout out. Yes. Karen Let's can see. attest to the fact that we do three hour webinars and no one falls asleep. There you go. Yes. <laughs> and there's an art to that too, but the the so much of it is just about feeling like you as the presenter are happy to be there. You're looking forward to spending this amount of time with the audience. You're enthusiastic about what you have to share with them. You believe it's important. You believe it'll make their lives better for them to learn the knowledge or the skill or whatever you're sharing and that your energy stays consistent insofar as your enthusiasm to share it with the audience. Now, I hear a lot of people protesting with comments like, well, but Laura, my, you know, I'm just a fill in the blank accountant or, you know, whatever stereotypical thing people like to use as an excuse for why they can't be interesting. Well, my information is just Monday morning, weekly team meeting update. I'm just going through these spreadsheets or whatever. My information is not all that exciting. My information is not funny. Well, I'd never said your information was exciting, had to be exciting 
or funny. That was never a caveat, a requirement, or even a implication. Right. It is important. Because if you believe that you're, what you're sharing in that meeting is important, then the energy that you use should convey that. Because yeah. if you feel like, okay, well, I'm really not sure why I'm here. I could just send you an email and you know let you read it for yourself. Then why are we here? Why are you wasting my time? Email it to me and I'll let you know five questions if I ever get around to reading it or not. But if it doesn't seem like you believe that there is inherent value in you orally delivering this information to us here and now as a group, then we have to reevaluate why we're having this meeting. So that's find the energy in you to say, is this important? You know, I worked with, with somebody in the, uh, in one of the larger banks and he was very much the, nope, when I'm called on, I read from my spreadsheets out loud. Nobody who's not in the six chairs around me can hear. And they had this ridiculously long conference table with probably about 20 people on either side. No one would hear him. He'd finish mumbling and then he'd sit down and everybody would kind of look at each other and they just move on with the meeting. And I was like, do, do you not understand that what you're doing is saying, I don't believe that what I am sharing with you has value because if I did, I'd make sure you heard it. And what everybody else is responding to you is, we agree. We don't think what you're sharing is has any real value to us either. Because if we did, we'd ask you to speak up. Yeah. Wow. That's, that's a hot spot for you, Laura, because I know what is your driving passion. We do, We talked about it this week. And it's having people be seen and heard. Isn't that your at your core? Heard and understood. Yes. Heard and understood. Part understood. of it. But yes, having people, my mission and my driving force is adding more joy and more peace to the world by helping more people feel heard and understood. Because Beautiful. that's at the core of most conflict. Yeah. Large. That's why that bothered you. That's why you're like, hey, hey, hey. Yeah. <laughs> well, and what was, what was funny about yourself. that? was was that about you know two weeks later i was back in in this particular bank and one of the other guys on the team said to me and took me aside it's like hey did you uh hear about what's his name and i was like no why what what happened They're like oh yeah at the the next meeting we had the next week when it was his turn you know he stood up and he like projected his voice and he's normally like a super soft-spoken person anyway but like he projected and he did this and he did that and everybody just kind of sat up and went like what got into him? And so I thought, okay, it's interesting that someone else is tech telling me secondhand. And I, so when I was there, I, I pulled him aside afterward and said, so I understand that you, you know, made some changes this time around, you know, what, what happened? And he's like, well, I just thought about it. And I realized I put a lot of work into that analysis and it's important. And I wanted everybody to hear it. It's like, and it's so funny that you sit there and you think, how long were you in this job? The, and going through the motions of this meeting every single week. And that thought never occurred to you. You know, and I don't say that critically. I say that, like, I, I'm asking everybody else out there now, ask yourselves, is that something that you just think to yourself, you know what, I, I never actually thought about it that way. I never put my finger on it. Well, put your finger on it now. What is the value of the work that you are contributing? If you believe it's there, be heard. Yes. Not just in volume. Yes, volume is the start. If you can't hear the volume, then the rest is moot. But okay, then what do you do with the import, the value, the energy that you share it with? So that's that's a really important piece to it. So thank you for that little tangent there. But <laughs> that, that's that's your passion, Laura. That's the like, passion. You, you heard it understood. Box, because that it matters. It matters. It really does. You know, the beautiful thing is I, I've worked with, in fact, most of the people I work with are serious people. Um, I, oh my gosh, I have a, a department with over 400 biostatisticians that I work with, right? They're serious. Math, science, they're super smart. Uh, I work with engineers. I work with IT folks. Uh, I've worked with attorneys, right? They're not comedians necessarily, some of them a little bit, but when they can lighten their speaking points in a presentation, either with humor or a story, people are engaged. They remember, gang, it's not hard. I'm telling you, it's not. Now, being a stand-up comic, writing a five-minute set, all right, I'm going to admit to you, that was a little hard. But weaving in something light and funny and memorable and 
that just takes a couple minutes of being mindful and putting it in. And if you need help, I'll tell you what, reach out, ask the people who are naturally good at this. Yes. Who are the natural storytellers? Show them your presentation. Where's an opportunity for humor here? Don't be afraid to ask for help. You don't have to do it all yourself. Right. I can tell you a lot of my jokes, um, are one which I can't share here because HR would probably um, not be happy with that. But that one joke is so much funnier. It was good. It's so much funnier because I had help from a friend mm. who saw it from a different angle. And he's like, you know what, T? Why don't you add this? And because I'm so serious, I'm like, I don't understand. That doesn't. Oh, okay. <laughs> that is funny. So ask for help. If you have funny friends, you have good presenters, they will help you punch it up and then it will start to get natural for you. Yeah. Yeah. And when you, the delivery is important. You have to own it when you deliver. Yes. If you're going to make the effort to throw that little one liner in there, whatever it is, it can't be sheepish. I mean, unless that's your shtick, if that's your your persona in your stand-up comedy, like you're the sheepish person and somehow you're going to make these lines. Who was the one-liner? Stephen Wright? Wasn't he oh. a stand-up comedy a stand -up comic from you know a decade or two ago? Yes. Where he was the king of the one-liners. <clears throat> Every joke was just one line, maybe two, but ultimately it was a one-liner and he was totally deadpan yep. through the he's, entire he's thing. Comic. He just landed at every line. And if that's your thing, you're the, like the timid, reserved, whatever it is, mumbly guy. Okay, then make that work. But if that's not you, then you can't suddenly shrink when delivering the line and then try to go back to being, right? you know, your professional self. It's got to be consistent with your nature. So deadpan is wonderful. And oh my gosh, Stephen Wright is the best. What was it? The, the sign said breakfast anytime. So I had French toast in the Renaissance. <laughs> breakfast anytime. Perhaps you've seen my seashell collection. It's on all the beaches of the world. But not a smile is cracked. Yes. Yes. You've got to absolutely make it land if, if that's what you're going to play. But you know your style, you know your persona, you know the energy that you're going to, to use. I actually got a really nice compliment. Um, earlier, well, not this week, last week, um, at the end of, a, again, a half day training, I finished and some, one of the guys looks at me and it was in person and he says, do you ever watch the marvelous Mrs. Maisel on Amazon? Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. The, you know, fabulous show. He's like, you have kind of a Maisel vibe to you. And I'm like, you know what? <laughs> I will amazing? take it. That was, oh yeah. I think it was intended as a compliment. I certainly took it as a compliment. Yes, but, yes. You know, just that there's content in there, but the to be able to throw a little humor in and keep it high energy yeah. and keep it quick and whatnot, just, it keeps it moving because you don't yeah. want people to feel like, no. okay, are we done yet? Are we done yet? Whether Mrs. it's a day, an hour. Yeah. She embodies confidence. If you haven't seen Mrs. Maisel, you got to watch at least. Got to watch it. But she doesn't have a, a second of doubt in her delivery. And part of the, the laugh is her confidence and directness and believing that she thinks she's funny. Yes. And she gets the laugh. Yeah, I've enjoyed that series. No, oh, it's fabulous. It's so smart and it's so fast. It is not a show you can watch when multitasking. No. You have to pay attention because the lines are fast and they the the banter among the characters, yeah, it's a lot of it is deadpan actually. It's just very <laughs> wry. But, um, oh, highly, highly recommended. I think one of the best comedy shows out there in, in I don't even know how long. So we have just a, like a minute left. Final tips, Teresa, and how can people learn more about you, about High Five Performance? All right. So I'm going to do this, Laura, and you're going to assist me because I'm going to do it. Going to do some cut and paste, and you're yep. going to do some cut and paste. So here's some stuff. So if you yep. want to stay in touch, connect with me on LinkedIn. I'd love to be connected. Just let me know where we met. If you would like to see me live, and these are some things that are coming up this week. Let me do this. So this Thursday, I'll be doing a keynote at Tri-State HRMA in South Jersey. It's going to be a great conference. I don't think you have to be an HR to, to come and join us, so you should. Uh, this Saturday night, I'll be at um, Visitation Parish in Norristown for a fantastic comedy show with uh, Chip Chantry, who is a good uh, friend of mine. 
And you might be saying to yourself, I'd like to do some stand-up comedy. Well, and on it, how this is going to turn out in our little cut and paste, here's some comedy classes oh, with instructors that are fabulous. Um, Chris Kosha, Chip Chantry, Vince Valentine, Mike Donovan, all within, uh, if you're in the Philadelphia area, all within about an hour of Philadelphia, except for Chris. He's in D.C., but he does some stuff virtually. And my last recommendation is for some improv. If you want to do improv, I got some instructors here, Sharon Geller, uh, Lauren Henry, and Avish Parashar. So no excuses. There's stuff out there. You can reach out to me. You can reach out to and take a class. Um, but but make your work come to life. Yes. Make your work come to life. Yes. And if you are out there and you're going, wait, Teresa, I can't type fast enough. I can't take notes. Well, then you'll just have to come back and watch the replay again and hit rewind and rewind and rewind until you get all of it. So we're going to get you back one way or another, but uh, please reach out to both of us on LinkedIn. Follow us on, on Twitter, on Instagram, on Facebook, on YouTube. Uh, do look us up and especially on LinkedIn. Uh, just remind us that you were here on the on our live, our LinkedIn live, our YouTube live event. Uh, it always helps us to know if we're going to connect with somebody where that person came from, that there is a legitimate connection to it. Any feedback is always welcome, funny or not. Uh, and of course, if we can be of service in any other way, I know either one of us is very happy to entertain questions, comments, uh, et cetera. So Thank you, everybody, for joining us today. If you want to stick around for another minute or so and put in the chat, we would love to know what your biggest takeaway is from today. If there's one thing that you're not going to forget, something that you're going to try to implement, something you're going to remind yourself, something about your confidence or a tip or the rule of three, whatever it is. And I know there's like a 30 second delay on the, uh, the chat on this, but what's one major takeaway? What really resonated with you today? We would love to know what has stuck. And of course, as you continue to, even if you're watching a replay of this later in the chat, still in the comments, put down what your takeaways are because we'll be able to see those as well. And that's something that uh, always helps us to know feedback is always valuable. Even if that joke stinks, then okay, tell us that because that helps us to get better. We take it out of the act for the next time. That's right. So even, even yes. constructive. Yes. Saber lines. <laughs> yes. 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 Good, good stuff. All right. Can, you can be authentic while still trying new things and being a bit uncomfortable. Linda, you just made my heart sing because there's so many people who absolutely divide that into black and white. It's A or B and it's not. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you for reinforcing that note. Saver lines, saver lines, save them. Yep. Go to Google, Google saver lines. You'll find lots of them. All right. Teresa, final parting words. Um, Enjoy your life. And, and my, my mantra in life is come from a place of love. So everything you do, every decision you make, have it come from a place of love. The, the world could use it right now. And it always has, and it still always will need that. So there's my parting word, come from a place of love. Can't top that. Thank you, Teresa, for joining us. Thank you, everybody else on, on YouTube and on LinkedIn for joining us. And feel free to connect. We love you. Hope to see you again the next time around on LinkedIn Live. Take care, everybody.